The matter of the universe is made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons. These three particles can combine in many different ways, and their particular combinations control many properties of the elements. The number of protons in an atom defines what element that atom is. If we have an, an atom with 11 protons, it is a sodium atom. The numbers of neutrons and electrons don't play a part in the identity of the atom. Every element has a standard symbol as well as a name. Sodium symbol is a capital N, lowercase a. Lots of elements have symbols derived from their names, but some element symbols come from older names that aren't really used in modern English. Sodium, for example, is called natrium in Latin, and so its symbol is Na. Any atom that has 34 protons is always an atom of selenium. Selenium's symbol is capital S, lowercase e. And an atom with 92 protons is going to be uranium, symbol U. The number of protons in an atom is referred to as the atomic number. The atomic number, name, and symbol for an element are all essentially interchangeable ways to specify that element. Since protons and neutrons are similar in size, and electrons are so very tiny, the total number of protons and neutrons estimates the mass of a given atom in AMUs. The mass number is always a whole number and only refers to a specific atom or group of identical atoms. The term isotope generally indicates that we are talking about atoms with a particular mass number. Most elements have more than one isotope, although some of the man-made elements have only ever been found with a single mass number. Carbon has three naturally occurring isotopes, carbon-12, carbon-13, and carbon-14. Sometimes you'll see an element symbol with a superscript number just in front of that symbol. Those numbers will always be the mass number. Mass numbers can't be found using a periodic table. You can find the atomic number and you can find the atomic mass for a given element. But any element may have several isotopes with different mass numbers. The atomic mass that's given on the periodic table is a weighted average of the mass numbers of all of the atoms of that element. The weighting factor is known as the relative abundance, which is usually given as a percentage. Relative abundance values are determined by sorting large samples of a given element into groups based on their mass numbers. These values are pretty constant across many large samples, which lets us assume that any sample of a given element will have the same isotope ratios. Take magnesium, for example. There are three naturally occurring isotopes of magnesium with mass numbers of 24, 25, and 26. Since the atomic number of magnesium is 12, the isotopes have 12, 13, and 14 neutrons, respectively. Magnesium-24 is the most common isotope with a relative abundance of 79%. If you were to collect 100 magnesium atoms, regardless of where you got them, you'd probably find about 79 magnesium-24 atoms. Magnesium-25 is present in bulk magnesium samples at a rate of about 10%, and the remaining 11% of magnesium atoms are magnesium-26. To find the atomic mass of magnesium, we multiply the relative abundance by the mass number for each isotope. Then we add those values together, and we're done. So for magnesium-24, we get... 18.96. Magnesium 25 gives us 2.50. And magnesium 26 gives us 2.86. Adding those values all together, 
we get 24.32. That's pretty much the atomic mass that's printed on periodic tables. Leaving neutrons for now, let's look at electrons. Atoms can gain or lose electrons to form ions. Ions never form from changing the number of protons because that would change the element altogether. Since electrons are negatively charged, an element that loses electrons becomes a positively charged cation. An element with more electrons than protons is a negatively charged anion. Metals form cations and nonmetals form anions. Metalloids can theoretically form either cations or anions depending on the situation. The equation protons minus electrons equals charge can be rearranged algebraically. In that case, you'd have protons minus charge equals electrons. In either form, the numbers of protons and electrons will be integers as they're counted objects. The charge can be positive or negative, and you should be careful if you're subtracting a negative number. For most of the representative elements, typical ionic charges can be determined using the periodic table. The noble gases don't form ions. Nonmetals all gain electrons to form anions. The number of electrons gained is found by counting the steps needed to go from a given nonmetal to the noble gas group. Chlorine takes one step. And so it forms a 1 minus anion. Nitrogen, on the other hand, is three steps away. And so it forms an ion with a charge of minus three. The metals lose electrons. And for the alkali and alkaline earth metals, the charges can be found by looking at the group number. The alkali metals are in group one and they take a charge of plus one. The transition metals generally form more than one cation. They can have two or more possible charges. And so the periodic table is less helpful in determining their charges.